Hello, hello. Uh, we are really pleased to have you again um, at our webinar. Today we will talk about Brexit and uh, IP-related issue and data protection, of course, uh, with our specialist uh, Bastian Brindons and Olivia uh, San Antonio. Um, so the the main uh, so we will um, talk about data protection and intellectual property in the second time. Uh, some practical issue you have to take into consideration uh, for those who uh, want to have a certificate of attendance and um, to get some point uh, for the permanent um, training and um, uh, knowledge. Uh, there will be during the seminar two questions and you have to reply to this question and so our colleague um, if you reply and show that you have listened to the entire seminar, you will get a certificate from Livian um, so that you can use and gain some point for your um, um, knowledge vis-a-vis uh, -vis your authority, uh, if you have a council, a bar association or in-house council association. The other point, a uh, practical issue, you can download our presentation on the right side. There is a PDF. Uh, on your screen and so you can download if you have to leave uh, for any minutes or or suppose everything what we're going to say is not uh, mentioned in this slide but most of, of them at least the bullet point uh, and so that it's quite a handful but we will go through the webinar and you will have uh, of course the slides going on so that uh, if you're not familiar too familiar with English, um, you can follow us. And I saw that in the attendee uh, part, there was a, a few of our colleagues from the UK and I welcome them. Uh, so they are checking what the European uh, leftover can say about them. But I suggest uh, to go directly as we got for Christmas the famous deal. And um, we are really pleased that they managed to give that as a Christmas gift. And so uh, let's go on directly because we have very little time. And uh, first, um, Bastian will talk about the um, data protection issue and Brexit. And Olivia will maneuver uh, all the slideshows. So let's start, uh, Olivia. Let's move on. The floor is yours, Bastian. Yes, thank you very much and welcome uh, all to this uh, webinar on Brexit IP and uh, data protection. So as uh, Anika already mentioned, the first part of our presentation is in fact a, a short overview of the consequences of Brexit for data protection. Uh, and I think we can immediately go to the next slide. The first question that arises uh, after Brexit or, or after the 1st of January 2021 is, uh, is the GDPR still applicable to UK companies? Um, and the answer is, in fact, uh, on the one hand, it's quite straightforward. On the other hand, there are some additional considerations. The principle is that as the UK has left the uh, European Union, the GDPR itself will no longer apply directly in the uh, UK and will no, no longer apply directly to UK companies. Um, what will apply to UK companies is uh, the GDPR as incorporated into UK law, which is the so-called UK GDPR, and which is more or less a copy of the GDPR, the EU GDPR as it stands today. But so, strictly speaking, the EU GDPR will no longer be applicable to UK companies, uh, at least not on the basis of the first um, criterion of application of the EU GDPR, which is the so-called establishment criterion, uh, which says that the GDPR, the EU GDPR applies when you are a company or an undertaking that is processing data within uh, and that has an establishment within the EU. However, as you know, there is a second criterion, the so-called targeting criterion, uh, which is laid down in Article 3.2 of the GDPR and which basically states that 
controllers and processors that are not established within the EU, but outside of the EU, but which are either targeting EU residents or monitoring EU residents, um, the EU GDPR will apply to them because of the so-called extraterritorial application of the GDPR. So as a consequence, even though the EU GDPR does no longer apply directly in the UK and is no longer uh, a part of the law in the UK, UK companies may still be, a, be subject to the EU GDPR through this uh, second criterion, the so-called targeting criterion. That being said, as of the 1st of January 2021, the UK should be considered as a third country. Uh, so just like other third countries like the US, like India, uh, and like other countries which do not form part of the uh, European Union. And this has an impact on the one hand for EU and UK organizations in case of cross-border data flows, which we, we will discuss uh, in the next slides under, under B. And it also has an impact for UK-based organizations in case of application of this famous Article 3.2, the so-called uh, targeting criterion. Let's have a look at those uh, two uh, sides of the coin. And let's start with uh, the issue of cross-border data flows. And we'll go to the next slide and then to the next slide. So as regards cross-border data flows, this was basically the main issue for uh, Brexit. Uh, everyone was uh, looking at what would happen with Brexit and with data flows after Brexit since the UK would become a so-called third country. Um, at the moment that there was not yet this EU-UK trade and cooperation agreement, a number of different options were open and we have summarized them here on this slide. Uh, basically, once the UK uh, is being considered as a third country, um, as you know, the GDPR says that transfers of personal data to third countries are in principle prohibited, except if you have additional measures or additional items that are being uh, put in place. And what are those different possibilities? The first is, of course, an adequate adequacy decision that would have been a possibility, but that was not there uh, and that is still not there. And we'll come back to that in a minute. The second option, if you transfer data to a third country, is putting in place yourself as an undertaking appropriate safeguards. And those appropriate safeguards can uh, consist of, for example, binding corporate rules, or they can consist of standard contractual clauses. And, and also there, we had immediately the issue of uh, SHRAMS 2. As you know, SHRAMS 2 has um, rendered more strict the rules for cross-border transfer uh, or extra EEA transfer of personal data. And it has, for example, said that companies before putting in place standard contractual clauses, they should um, carry out a so-called transfer impact assessment and, and assess themselves the level of uh, data protection in the third country. And they should, in case that they come to the conclusions that the standard contractual clauses are not sufficient, they should put in place additional safeguards. So there again, we had already a question whether we could work with standard contractual clauses once that the, the, the UK had left the European Union. Of course, there are, there are also a, no, a number of other mechanisms foreseen in the GDPR, like uh, codes of conduct and uh, certification mechanisms. That is basically the second set. And then the third set is the so-called derogations that you find in the GDPR. Uh, a very limited number of derogations where you can transfer personal data to a third country, notwithstanding the fact that this country is not has not received an adequacy decision and notwithstanding the fact that you have not put in place yourself 
appropriate safeguards. And the most, uh, or yes, the most known of these derogations is, of course, the explicit consent of the um, data subject. Now, this uh, slide uh, summarizes a bit the situation before the UK uh, EU Trade and Cooperation Agreement. Let's now look uh, at the next slide, which is with the EU UK Trade and Cooperation Agreement. Um, this agreement was uh, adopted on the 24th of December, so it was indeed a kind of a Christmas gift from the EU and from the UK to uh, European and UK businesses. What does it say about data protection and about cross-border data flows? Well, in fact, it puts in place a so-called bridging mechanism because everyone recognizes that uh, the EU has failed to adopt uh, an adequacy decision by the 31st of December 2020. So we had an issue about uh, transfer of personal data as of the 1st of January 2021. And in order to bridge that gap between the 31st of December 2020 and the date that a, an adequacy decision will be uh, adopted, um, this bridging mechanism was put in place. What does it say? Well, it says that um, UK will not be considered as a third country yet during a certain grace period or a so-called so bridge period. And that period will last for four months up to six months. And we all expect, I think, that it will indeed last during six months, six months or shorter if an adequacy decision has been adopted uh, prior to the expiry of this six month period. The prerequisite for this is that uh, the UK does not amend its current UK data protection legislation during this so-called four to six months uh, period. What does this mean? Uh, well, it means that personal data after the 1st of January 2021 can continue to be transferred to the UK without the need for additional safeguards. And at the same time, the EU and the UK agreed that they will not restrict cross-border data uh, flows during this period. So this is indeed good news. Um, it's in fact, the good news is double. On the one hand, we can continue to, or businesses can continue to transfer data to the UK without having to put in place additional safeguards. And the second good news is that uh, we are we are all expecting an adequacy decision to be adopted within at the latest six months as from the 1st of January uh, 2021. Just by way of reminder, what does this uh, adequacy decision um, entail? Uh, it entails, in fact, uh, about four steps. First of all, there should be uh, a proposal from the Commission. This all will need to be done within the next uh, six months. So a proposal from the Commission. There will need to be an advice from the European Data Protection Board on the proposal of the Commission. The member states should approve this proposal. And then the last step and the fourth step is that um, a decision, a formal adequacy decision is adopted by the European uh, Commission. But so this uh, bridging mechanism uh, to cover this period of four, uh, or, or four to six months is indeed helpful for all companies that are currently transferring personal data to the UK. Maybe uh, by way of a side note, the UK has also deemed uh, the EU adequate um, on a transitional basis, and we all expect this uh, transitional period to last until the end of 2024. So also in the reverse, the reverse flow from the UK to the EU will not pose a, uh, an issue until end of 2024. Let's go to the next slide. A number of other consequences for European EEA organizations, uh, what do you need to think about? Okay, we have this bridging mechanism, which facilitates, in fact, 
uh, data transfers to the UK, but there's still a number of items that you should keep in mind. First of all, um, have a look at your free, fair processing notices and your privacy policies, because they will probably need to be adapted uh, in order to mention transfers to the UK and the UK being a third country as of the 1st of January. Secondly, same task or the same uh, review will need to take place with respect to your records of processing activities or processing operations. There again, you will need to specify that transfers are taking place to the UK and mention the UK as a third country, among other in the section on international data transfers. Third, uh, if you have done DPIAs or will be doing DPIAs in the future, keep in mind that um, the UK has become a third country and that you will need to mention this also and to handle this uh, subject also in your DPIAs, in the future DPIAs, but also review existing DPIAs upon which you are relying for existing processing operations. And then last point for, again, we are still talking about EU companies or EEA companies. EEA companies might need to appoint a representative in the UK. Why is that? Because as I said in the very beginning, within the UK, uh, the EU GDPR does no longer apply, but the UK GDPR applies. And the UK GDPR contains clauses which are identical or similar to, uh, for example, Article 3.2 of uh, the EU GDPR, which is the so-called targeting criterion, and Article 27 of the EU GDPR, which contains the principle that if you are doing business or if you are targeting or monitoring data subjects uh, within the EU, but here within the UK, you need to appoint in certain cases a representative. And so EU companies that are indeed targeting the UK or are monitoring data subjects within the UK will need to investigate whether they do not have to appoint a representative under the UK GDPR within the UK. second uh, set of uh, slides and considerations is about the impact for UK-based organizations. And this may also apply if you have affiliates or subsidiaries in the UK. So what are those um, considerations? What is the impact for UK-based organizations? And we will go into more detail in the, in the following slides. First, the end of the one-stop shop mechanism. I will explain that in the next slide. Secondly, the possible appointment of an EU representative within the EU, so by UK companies, because of the application of Article 3.2 of the GDPR. And third, also from a UK perspective, the need to review and amend uh, policies. Let's look at the first uh, element, the end of the one-stop shop mechanism. So basically, as of the moment that uh, the UK left the EU, so on the 1st of January 2021, the EU does no longer participate in the one-stop shop mechanism. It will also no longer be able to act as a lead supervisory authority for binding corporate rules because it is outside of the EU. And as a result, UK-based organizations or undertakings will no longer benefit from this one-stop shop mechanism. That being said, when we read the EU-UK uh, trade agreement, it nevertheless suggests that there will be um, further quite close cooperation between, on the one hand, the ICO and on the other hand, the European or the EU data protection um, authorities, including the European Data Protection Board. But 
formally speaking, the ICO will no longer be part of the European Data Protection Board. It will no longer participate in this one-stop shop mechanism, and it will no longer be able to act as a lead supervisory authority for companies or groups of undertakings that want to adopt BCRs for or under the um, EU GDPR. Is or are there any exceptions? Well, yes, we think there are indeed exceptions. Um, if you are a data controller with several establishments in the EU and there is one establishment within the EU or within an EU member state that meets the criteria for being a main establishment under the EU GDPR, you may still benefit from the one-stop shop mechanism, but then for your the, the, the part of your group of undertakings, that is established within the EU and it excludes, of course, the uh, UK company. So what are the, the, the to-dos? Uh, first of all, uh, when you are in that uh, situation, first of all, select a new competent uh, supervisory authority within the EU. If, you, uh, if there's any of your affiliates uh, that meets the, the criteria, Secondly, check whether additional notification of GPO, if any, is necessary to the competent supervisory authority. And last but not least, uh, again, review your website privacy policies, your fair processing notices to reflect this change of lead supervisory authority. That is uh, the first impact. The second impact, and we go to the next slide, is um, EU representative. So when you are uh, a UK company that is either targeting uh, data subjects within the EU or is monitoring data subjects within the EU and you are subject to the EU GDPR, you may need to appoint uh, an EU representative that is laid down in Article 27 of the GDPR. The principle is that um, the appointment of an EU representative is mandatory, except in a few cases. Uh, there are basically two cases. First of all, if you are a public authority or body, there is no need to uh, appoint an EU representative. <coughs> Second, <coughs> Second um, exception is where the data processing is occasional, does not include the processing of either sensitive data or criminal data, and is unlikely to result in a risk for the rights and the freedoms of natural persons. But you see that this exception is quite uh, limited. Question, in which country do you need to um, appoint an EU representative? Well, you need to appoint an EU representative in the country where your data subjects or the data subjects that you are targeting or monitoring are located. Uh, one of those EU member states, in one of those EU member states, you will need to appoint an EU representative. Remember that the uh, appointment of an EU representative does not um, is without prejudice to the, the liability of the controller or the processor that is um, appointing this representative. In other words, legal actions against the processor or the controller that is located or established outside of the EU are still possible. And then again, <clears throat> Once you have um, appointed an EU representative, adjust your website privacy policy, your privacy notices, your fair processing notice to reflect uh, the fact that there is an EU representative. Last item on the list for UK companies, review and amend your uh, policies or fair processing notices. Uh, on a number of points, we have noted here three of them. First of all, EU representative. So whether you have appointed or not an EU representative and who is that uh, EU representative. Secondly, the correct supervisory authority. If you have changed lead supervisory authorities as a result of uh, Brexit, 
then you may uh, want to uh, mention the new lead supervisory authority that you have identified. And then, of course, um, make sure that you reference correctly either the EU GDPR or the UK GDPR 2018 Data Protection Act uh, in your fair processing notices and privacy policies. And that is basically an overview of the consequences for um, EU companies and for UK companies on the issue of Brexit and data protection. Before I hand the floor to Olivia to start with the chapter on the consequences for intellectual property, we have a small poll question. And the question is, do you need to implement safeguards to transfer currently personal data to the UK? Yes or no? And I will leave you some time to answer this question. Good morning, uh, everyone. Uh, as announced, uh, I will now further discuss the impact uh, of Brexit on intellectual property rights. Um, regarding intellectual property rights, we will discuss three topics. Uh, I will focus on the first topic, uh, namely prosecution of IP right, and then I will leave the floor to Annick to discuss the contracting and enforcement aspect of IP right due to the Brexit. So, first of all, prosecution. As you know, IP assets and IP portfolio might have a very high value for a company. So it can be really important to, for a company to manage well uh, its IP right and uh, to know which IP right uh, it has and what's the scope of protection and especially the territorial scope. With Brexit, um, the issue uh, of prosecution and the uh, anal analysis of the uh, IP portfolio is really important and some step might be uh, to have undertaken by companies. We will thus uh, further discuss regarding prosecution about trademarks, design, copyright, patent and domain name. First of all, trademark. Here we will focus on EU trademark and not uh, over uh, Benelux trademark uh, registration. Why? Because the impact of Brexit on Benelux trademark is really very limited. Um, it's only if um, a company uh, holder of a Benelux trademark as for trademark representative a uh, UK uh, company, a UK person, that it will have to uh, change its trademark representative and opt for one uh, located in the EU. So regarding uh, trademarks and Brexit, uh, the main impact and the main issue are related to EU trademark registration. In this respect, there are three different scenarios. The first scenario is you have a UK trademark registration before 31 December 2020. The second scenario is you have an EU trademark application before 31 December 2020. And the third one, you decide no to apply for an EU trademark uh, application. We shall start with the first scenario. So you already had a EU trademark registration before uh, the end of last year. In such a case, what will, uh, what will happen? You will automatically have a clone uh, trademark registration in the UK trademark register, the e UK IPO and uh, this will be done uh, automatically and your UK trademark registration will have the same filing date and the same priority date that your uh, 
EU trademark registration. So you will have at the same time two uh, rights, one covering 27 uh, states member in the EU and one in the UK. It's called a comparable trademark. Um, you have the possibility if you are not interested, for instance, by the UK market and you know that you will not use your EU trademark on such market, you can decide to opt out and not to obtain such comparable uh, trademark. That's possible. Uh, what you need to know and what you need to do is that for the UK comparable trademark, you will need to appoint a UK uh, trademark representative. Last question regarding uh, the first scenario, it's about the renewal of uh, this trademark registration. If the renewal date was before uh, 31 December 2020, then it will be, and that you have renewed it, you have renewed it both for the EU trademark registration as well as for the UK comparable trademark. But if your renewal date is after 31 December, then you will have to renew in the EU and then also in the UK if you want to have protection in both territory. And it does not matter if you proceed with the renewal before 31 December. What is important, the date that is important, is the effective renewal date. So if it was only in March and that you proceeded in uh, December, then you will have also to renew in the UK register. Second scenario, you um, have uh, EU trademark application on uh, 31 December 2020. What happened then? Then you have a grace period and you have nine months to apply for a, a UK uh, trademark application and registration. So there is no automatic cloning of the trademark, no you will have to do all the steps and follow the uh, UK procedural rules and also pay uh, for the fees, for instance, and the UK IPO will uh, examine your trademark and check whether it's uh, a valid sign uh, or not. So, sorry, I forgot to change the slide. What uh, you need to do so in such case, you have to decide whether you wish uh, to apply for a UK uh, trademark uh, and have a, um, a, a similar trademark registration in the UK. You will like for the already registered trademark uh, enjoy from the same filing date and priority date, so that's nice. Uh, but uh, you will need to appoint a UK representative and pay the fees, as I said. Third and last uh, scenario regarding trademark. You want now to apply for an EU trademark uh, application as a UK or as an EU company, you are, of course, still entitled to do so. Uh, but uh, you will only uh, enjoy a protection within the EU in the 27 countries and no longer in the UK. Second right, uh, design. For um, design, as you most probably know, there is like for uh, the EU uh, trademark registration, there is a, a similar uh, protection uh, for design and in one's uh, request and one's application you can enjoy a protection in the entire uh, EU territory. So um, the rules with Brexit and the impact of Brexit on this community design registration are I would say quite easy because they are the same as for trademark so if your design was already registered before 
31 December, then they will be automatic, automatically cloned. And if not, if it was still an application, then you will uh, enjoy a grace period of nine months. Um, as you know, also maybe for um, community design, there is a difference between registered design and unregistered design. Um, the scope of protection is different, the duration of protection is different, but it can be interesting for companies to enjoy the uh, status of unregistered um, design rights, community design rights, and uh, what's the rule now with Brexit? If you add such rights uh, before uh, 31 December, you will still enjoy uh, the, the, the protection for the three year duration period. So um, that's also uh, a nice thing. Uh, but with unregistered rights, uh, design rights, you have to be careful with uh, the country where you will first uh, disclose uh, your design because uh, depending on the country of disclosure, you can have issue with the novelty requirements. So you have to decide whether to disclose it first in the UK or uh, in the EU. Third, IP rights, patents. Um, regarding patents, uh, Brexit has, I would say, mainly no impact uh, and all the European patent uh, application will still uh, remain uh, um, enforced and unchanged. Um, why? Because um, UK will remain member uh, of the European uh, Patent Office, which is not really part of the EU, and uh, so all um, the rules and all the European patent uh, will uh, remain uh, unchanged. So that's great news, of course. The only thing regarding patent is that if one day we have the unified uh, patent code, so the UPC, uh, the UK will not participate, but it's future only. Sorry, I forgot speaking about copyright. Uh, copyright is like a patent uh, in the sense that Brexit does not have really an impact of the uh, copyright and copyright protection for EU and UK uh, companies. Why? Uh, because uh, most uh, of the rule regarding uh, copyright depends on international treaties uh, like the Berne Convention, and since these countries are all members of these conventions, the rule of this convention will still apply, like the national treatment, the automatic protection, and uh, uh, the requirement for protection. So we can uh, say that most EU or UK work will still enjoy protection in UK or in EU. Um, that's for copyright. Then, beside copyright, you also have uh, database rights. Uh, with the Brexit for database, there is an impact since UK uh, companies are now uh, excluded from uh, EU protection of newly created uh, database, and uh, UK businesses can or ever rely on UK database, right? And also all future and upcoming uh, EU legislation like the DSA and the DMA um, that for which we speak a lot the last week with the two uh, draft proposal will not be applicable for UK. And last uh, but not least, uh, IP rights uh, I will discuss regarding uh, prosecution uh, uh, aspect. It's domain name and more particularly uh, that EU uh, domain name because with Brexit there are 
uh, some uh, changes uh, for uh, UK uh, businesses and companies. Um, the letter are no longer entitled uh, to use uh, such uh, extension um, and there will be a withdrawal revocation um, after the 31 March uh, uh, 2021. So we are still in a sort of transitional period, I would say. And during this period, there are two options for UK company or they also have uh, an establishment in the EU and then such EU establishment can become the owner uh, of uh, this uh, the EU domain name. But if it's not the case, then uh, the UK business has to migrate to another uh, extension. That was uh, all the, the, the question regarding uh, persecution and no uh, one uh, question regarding uh, the pool and just to see whether you attended well this webinar. Um, is a UK business allowed to register for a .au domain name as of 1st January 2021? Yes or no? Bonjour, j'espère que vous avez bien écouté Olivia. Manifestement, je reviendrai après sur l'épaule. Euh, écoutez bien parce que je crois qu'il y a encore beaucoup de confusion euh, dans, les, dans les réponses. Mais bon, dans, pour ce qui concerne les contrats, euh, ben, certainement, ça va avoir une répercussion euh, hyper importante en ce qui concerne euh, l'aspect la, la, euh, territorial. Sorry, I forgot that I was... Uh, English. <laughs> so I switch back to English. Um, so, um, of course, the aspect of con uh, on contract, the, the most important issue is the uh, territorial scope of the contract. And as of now, um, UK do not belong anymore to European Union. In all the contracts where you refer to um, EU, European Union, what do you mean? And of course, uh, regarding intellectual property, um, the court will go and see what is the intention of the party. And of course, if you don't do anything, we of course advise you to specifically make addendum to your contract to specifically clearly make whether or not UK is still uh, part of the contract. But the, the court uh, will go and see and examine uh, if you still have registered rights in UK after uh, the 31st of, of December, then of course that means that you intended in fact to consider that the protection, uh, EU protection will also be covered and extended to the UK. So um, it, it, it is a matter of interpretation. We don't know yet. It's a little bit like at the time of uh, when EU, there was new member state, whether these new member states are uh, automatically part of the EU scope of your contract. It's not automatic, but here it will see whether you have forgotten or you have um, um, uh, changed your contract. And, and basically the advice uh, it's to provide, go through all your, your, your contract and, and really check uh, whether you need to specify or not, whether you want to include, it's advisable. Also reference to EU legislation, um, if um, it's provided for EU legislation, that means that it's not necessarily UK legislation as of uh, the 1st of January. So you really have to go through all these details and do a due diligence for your contract. So next is also uh, very important um, is the enforcement of your IP rights. And uh, you have to take into uh, consideration that the UK court are no longer competent um, for EU trademarks, um, community design, and also not allowed anymore to issue EU-wide injunction. So that, uh, although the uh, legislator wanted really to make 
uh, sure that um, it doesn't cost to the business um, uh, something, but of course here it will have an impact. However, the, if you're, you have already um, a current um, proceedings going on, of course these proceedings um, will have the same effect and you will not be affected by such. So that if you go, uh, if you have a pending litigation in the UK, you will still grant um, a pan-European injunction and vice versa. Uh, but of course, if you have a new um, uh, case uh, going on after uh, uh, starting as of 1st January, uh, then you will no longer have a new pan-European injunction and you will need to also litigate and introduce a new action in the UK to have your right uh, recognize uh, in that country. And uh, for, so for the time being, I think that there will be a kind of still a, a harmonization uh, within case law because um, they have included the, in the UK legislation a very similar rule to, 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 the, to, the, to the EU because also there was international uh, treaty uh, regarding IP rights. But we can imagine that uh, after a while, there may be uh, some divergence of interpretation because we have seen in the past that the UK judges sometimes have not really the same uh, approach um, than uh, the European or, 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 or civil law uh, jurisdiction. And so that with the time as the court, uh, UK court will not longer be obliged to follow the interpretation of the EU um, uh, Court of Justice. We, we may expect uh, some divergence uh, of interpretation and, and some divergence also in the application of your rights. Uh, another point also um, that will be quite interesting, you can go to the next slide, um, Olivia, is the exhaustion of IP rights. And here we are facing some kind of uh, dissimilarity. Um, in fact, um, so that there was um, there was uh, uh, um, so usually when you put on the market one product within the EU, uh, it's considered as you have exhausted your rights, so that you cannot prevent um, para, uh, import in another country, uh, EU country, and it's applicable to the. European uh, economic area. So it's a little bit broader than st strictly speaking the um, EU, um, European Union. But then um, as of now, in fact, uh, so UK is no longer um, part of the economic um, area. And so that uh, if you put a product on the European market and uh, it doesn't mean that you allow its commercialization in the UK. And, and so that it, it's quite, um, uh, uh, so that we will be faced um, uh, cases with parallel import. And, and that means that you, you may have some issue in the coming months. Uh, and so you have to make really sure and review your contract is affected, of course, because then uh, when you have the scope, um, if you give the authorization for uh, the European Union, it doesn't mean anymore that you have um, authorization for the UK. But uh, there was quite um, an asymmetry uh, in this uh, matter because the UK, at least for the moment, they say that they will um, recognize the um, exhaustion of rights uh, so that if it's in the UK, that, that means that uh, there was an authorization, but, but uh, on the other side, um, the UK government has said that they will revise the matter in the coming weeks. I don't know, maybe our colleague can make a, a, little, a UK colleague can make a little um, um, confirmation or um, uh, a little note about that. Um, so we expect that uh, probably the UK um, government and authority will no longer accept this asymmetric approach and we expect in the coming weeks uh, or, or months for sure 
uh, a divergence and then that exhaustion will be um, uh, not recognized anymore uh, as it is for the moment. Um, another aspect of um, enforcement of course, is the use and the, in, in the trademark uh, dispute, of course, the use of a trademark is very important and it's um, at, at several uh, levels, uh, especially because if you have to, to prove the use of your trademark um, in the course of a litigation to safeguard your right, you have to be aware that now the, the, the use of a trademark um, in UK uh, will no longer uh, be taken into consideration for, uh, to see whether your rights are, are safeguarded in, 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 um, in, in the European Union and vice versa. So it's not because that you have using uh, your, your, your rights in the European Union that these use will be um, considered as a genuine use uh, or, or use for a reputation in, in UK. So you really have now, to, if you have a trademark in the UK and you want to safeguard it in the UK, you really have to use that mark in the UK and uh, collect evidence um, in, in that country uh, if you want to establish your, your right and um, so that you cannot rely anymore uh, on the potential use in other country. Um, that it's an important point and, and so that you have to have in your um, management. I mean, um, we, we made uh, our last seminar uh, in uh, November about uh, proof of use. And here, so you will have to have your uh, proof of use for, for, for the EU, but, but also for, for UK. So you have to be careful about that uh, because it's going to be kind and probably people who did not register trademark previously in, in the UK because they knew that there was a use at the European level. Now, maybe they will uh, uh, file a trademark in the UK because they know that they, you cannot use anymore your argument that you have a European trademark and that it may affect. So that it's something very important to watch out um, um, in the coming uh, months. Uh, another aspect, you can go to the next slide, Olivia. It's, uh, of course, the um, enforcement at the border. And uh, uh, so the European community has put in place a very, um, a very uh, strong um, uh, system that you apply a pan-European uh, um, system where you put a file, an application for action at a European level and which is valid uh, all over Europe, including UK, that system stop. So is that any more your, your, your custom surveillance program is going to be national regarding the UK and you need to do a, and file a submission specific for the UK and you cannot rely anymore for the uh, European, uh, pan-European uh, system anymore. And then of course, um, it will, also, you need to, 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 to make um, uh, designate uh, a UK uh, representative and vice versa. The UK uh, representative are no longer um, uh, allowed to uh, represent at the European level. And we can see that uh, recently uh, a few, uh, of course, the UK firm usually has, a, has an office in, in, in Europe already, but uh, we noticed like uh, recently that the a new uh, firm just established uh, a new firm in Brussels, notably, uh, just to make sure to have an antenna and to be able to continue to uh, provide service for the um, uh, European client and not to have uh, transfer to the colleague in the European Union. So, um, it, so is it, this is why it, it's important in the custom surveillance, but also in the portfolio uh, aspect to, to really just double check whether you have all your legal representative uh, and content point in order, just to make sure that there was no hiatus uh, in your uh, brand protection um, uh, scheme. So I think that we went through uh, all these um, issues 
Um, of course, we see that it's quite important for the future to have, um, uh, uh, and we see that the, the uh, most of the uh, authority they had made sure to, to secure, and it was a, quite a worry to have a strong protection for the IP right. I think that we still have uh, such a strong level of protection and that it's a good goal achieved by the authority. Of course, there was a lot of um, interrog um, interrogation uh, question uh, that we will come in the few uh, months uh, to clarifying uh, standpoint of view. And of course, um, it's quite complicated when I can see that the, um, the, the reply to our poll question, uh, you were, uh, most of you, uh, manage to, to, to reply correctly to our question. And of course, uh, for the first question of uh, Bastian, you don't need to, 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 uh, to, to take a specific uh, safeguard if you transfer um, uh, to, the, to, to the UK. And also, but I see that from the response uh, regarding uh, the domain name issue, uh, if a UK business is allowed to use um, uh, EU domain name if it's not located there, no, uh, they will have uh, the EU domain name is reserved for the EU uh, location um, businesses and there you really have to, to, to review your, your strategy and, and change your, 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 your domain name basically. Uh, I don't know if we have a, a little time. There was a question, uh, Bastian. Maybe um, I think that it was addressed to you. I don't know if you have time um, to correct, and, and that I will leave the floor to to Bastian for the closure of this and reply maybe to you to the question somebody has raised. Okay, indeed, there was. Uh, we have received one question regarding uh, the part on data protection. Um, the question was whether um, if an EU authority has started an investigation or an inquiry before the, the 1st of January uh, 2021, but the conclusions have not yet been reached, whether the uh, one-stop shop mechanism will apply or not to the UK company or to the UK part, I understand, of the organization. Um, I must say that this is uh, this is indeed quite a particular uh, question, quite specific. Um, if we look at the EU uh, UK trade agreement, um, there is not really um, there are no really uh, measures taken in, in the sense of transitional measures for existing um, existing investigations. That being said, I think that it is clear, and it was also already clear before this EU-UK trade agreement, that uh, once the, um, the UK left the, uh, the European Union, it would no longer be part of this one-stop shop mechanism. So um, for, for um, existing um, investigations or, or pending investigations, I believe that indeed, if the investigation has started prior to the, the 1st of January, that the investigation will continue without the ICO being heard, and that uh, as a result, the ICO could, for example, for the, for the UK part, start its own um, investigation, and which may lead or may not lead to um, separate uh, sanctions from the sanctions that have been decided by the EU uh, Data Protection Authority that has, um, has started the investigation. I would just like to add one thing uh, here, that is, if this is an organization that is uh, present in multiple countries uh, within the EU and has, for example, one or two affiliates in the UK, of course, uh, the one-stop-shop mechanism uh, and the consistency mechanism uh, may may uh, continue to apply for those um, data protection authorities within the EU which are affected, but always excluding, I believe, excluding the uh, the UK ICO. So basically, for the um, uh, for if you look at the the one stop shop principle, what does it mean for companies? The end of the one stop shop mechanism 
uh, and, and the ICO's involvement. It's uh, first of all that the ICO has no role anymore to play within this one-stop shop mechanism, is not being heard and so, and so on. But secondly also, and that's of course a drawback, uh, the ICO is, is a separate um, uh, regulator and may separately start investigations, inquiries, and separately come to conclusions which may or may not be the same as those which are reached by uh, EU data protection authorities. Um, last comment on this question is that, um, as I already said, the EU-UK trade agreement uh, nevertheless provides that there will be some further close cooperation between EU and UK uh, ICO. So I would not exclude that in this case of this pending investigation that the ICO is nevertheless being heard but then outside the framework of the one-stop shop uh, mechanism, but rather on an ad hoc basis, uh, as this is done with sometimes uh, uh, data protection regulators in countries such as India and other third countries. Okay, thank you, um, Bastian. And I see that ticked up two minutes uh, behind schedule, so we better close and uh, so that you can enjoy uh, your lunch and our afternoon and we have um, another webinar uh, next week uh, regarding corporate and finance and check our LinkedIn profile um, of our office to, to have further details. Good afternoon and thank you for your time and thank you to my colleague and uh, enjoy your afternoon. Bye-bye.